Okay, welcome to uh, Calvary Chapel Divine. If you want to go ahead and mark your Bibles, we'll be in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 26. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. We went through the triumphal entry uh, probably six or eight weeks ago, with uh, right before Easter. So there's no reason for me to to reteach that, uh, especially when it's available online. Uh, we, but we are going to read through it because there's something very important that happens in verse 11 that we need to cover for verse 12. So go ahead and uh, just go ahead and get to Mark chapter 11. That's where we're going to be uh, today. Our announcements for today. Uh, first off, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Thank you all so much for, uh, for tuning in and, and being here. Uh, the tacos are back this week, so it broke my heart last week. Um, we had one of the kids, I saw her go back there and, she, you know, she saw the, the cinnamon rolls and she was like, where's the tacos? And so we were like, okay, we got to make sure the tacos are, are back this week. So uh, they are back. But uh, Wednesday night, we start our summer series for Under His Influence, yielding to, uh, yielding to the Work of the Holy Spirit by Pastor Lloyd Pulley. Pastor Lloyd Pulley is actually a Calvary Chapel uh, pastor out of Old Bridge, uh, New Jersey. He was actually one of the pastors that helped out during 9-11. And, uh, and uh, the book that he wrote is one of the ones that we're going to be going over for the summer series. We're, it's, we're taking a break from uh, the Old Testament just for a few weeks. And then we'll, we'll be back in the, new, in the Old Testament and uh, write it as, as the kids go back to school in the fall. We'll start the book of Genesis. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, so it's going to take us some time to get through the book of Genesis, but we'll get through it. Uh, and so the, the book itself, when you go to the website, all you do is, is go to calvarydivine.org. The, um, on the website it says Summer Series. Just click that. The book itself, the PDF, is available. I will have physical books here on Wednesday for those who need a physical book. Because I know some of us do, do not do well reading on phones or tablets. And that's okay. And so uh, I left some of those books at the house. But we'll make sure that they arrive here on Wednesday. All you have to read this week is the introduction. Now, remember we talked about homework. So there are a couple of them over here off the, uh, on the table here. These are the questions you have to answer for your homework this week. So I printed some of them because some of y'all may want them printed. And so you can write out your answers. Um, and so, uh, again, I, do, I don't want you not to come because you didn't do your homework. Or you, you, you didn't get through the reading. All right? Don't allow that to keep you from coming. You come anyway. Because I'm still going to go through the chapter for about 20, 25 minutes. I'll run through the chapter itself that we're going over that week. And then we'll, we'll cut the feed online and then we're going to sit down and actually go through the questions together. And, and like I said, even though you may have not have done your homework, somebody else has, and it's going to help you. There may be something that you need to hear from it. And let me tell you, you cannot live this life without the power of the Holy Spirit as a Christian. I think one of the first questions they ask you is, is do you think being a Christian is too hard? And, and it, if you're doing it in your flesh, it is. So I just gave you one of your answers already. So, uh, yeah, there you go. All right. So, well, introduction. That's all you need to read this week is the intro. And, uh, and, so, and then we'll go into it. So hopefully you all will come for the summer series and, and be a part of it. Um, and again, the book's available online. Uh, it's a free PDF. Uh, Lloyd Pulley gave the book away. Uh, as well as the, uh, one of his other ones that he has, which is a really good one on sharing the gospel. And uh, we've done the book before. It's, it, it's amazing when you go through it. It's a really good one. Uh, the church worship, picnic, potluck, and baptism. Church worship, picnic, potluck, and baptism. Paradise Canyon is where it's going to be held on July 10th, uh, 2022. The park opens up at 8 a.m. As of right now, my understanding is church will be at 10. So we're not meeting here on the 10th. We're meeting in Paradise Canyon. So it is a number of churches that are coming together, Calvary chapels throughout the area. I believe Casterville, uh, Calvary New Life, and Helotus is going to be there. Um, uh, Calvary Chapel Southside. And so it's going to be a time for us to be able to come together. 
and uh, we'll, we will have, so don't think you're getting out of church. We are going to have church. There will be a teaching, and then we'll have a potluck. We'll break bread together. So actually what we'll be doing is actually an Acts 2.4.2 event where we, we have the Word of God. We spend time in prayer. We have koinia, which is actually admonishing each other with the Word, and, and then uh, we break bread together. And, and uh, so 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., is, you can get there as early as you want. It takes, I looked at the map, it takes about 40 to 45 minutes from here to get there. If somebody's going to need a ride, just let me know, and we'll meet y'all here and take y'all there. And, uh, and, and we'll work on getting rides for that. Um, potluck, if you can bring something, bring something. If not, it's okay. Don't let that keep you from coming. Baptisms. If anybody wants to be baptized that day, if you haven't been baptized, you can be baptized that day. I just, you just need to get with me and I'll let me know so we can make sure you get baptized that day. Um, and, and so it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you all can make it out. It's Sunday, July 10th. Then the youth retreat is coming. Um, right now, as of right now, I think they're sitting somewhere around 50 to 55 kids, and that's still going. So we're just praying, you know, that that gets what, you know, we're hoping that they have close to 70 kids this year. Um, but we're just praying for it and, and see what happens. So the youth retreat, uh, we're, we're partnering up with uh, Grace Calvary Chapel, and it's going to be at HEB Encampment. And so it's uh, $60 for the youth retreat for those that want to, uh, to go. It's a great time for your kids to, you know, the best part about that? There's no Wi-Fi. There's no phone. As soon as you come down that mountain, it's gone. Even for the us, we don't have it. And, and so it's, it's, I mean, they have landline phones, which most kids don't know what those are, right? Uh, and so we can, if, if we need to call out or we need to call a parent, we can do all that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a good time for, for people to disconnect from, uh, especially our kids, to disconnect from technology and just be with the Lord, have some fun. At the same time as they're learning the Word of God, they, they, they get to, to spend time with other youth. And uh, it's amazing the stuff that you see that's going on with these kids that are struggling with different things. And, and how they come in on Friday or they come in Thursday. They leave Thursday, right? They come in on Thursday, and they're just jittery. They don't know what to do with themselves. And by Friday, God's gotten a hold of them. And there's always that one or two kids, that, that one or two that's just a knucklehead. You know, that happens. But by Saturday, God gets a hold of them. I say it him because it's usually the boys. Yeah, and all. Um, and so hopefully y'all y'all get to send your kids to go to that. And and if you if you need sponsorship or if you if you want to sponsor kids, you can do that. Um, just when you do your tithe in the box, just say it's sponsorship for youth, and we'll make sure it goes to that. Uh, I'll make sure it gets sent to Grace Calvary Chapel for that reason. Let's go ahead and stand as we read uh, Mark chapter eleven verses one through eleven, and then I'll get into the rest of it. We're going to just go ahead and cover that and. And then we'll dive into our verses in verses 12 to 26. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as, as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosened it. Uh, but some of, of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosening the, the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down the leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went to Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already, already late, he went out 
to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, today. As we dive into the remaining verses of uh, 12 through 26, we ask that you be with us and uh, speak to each one of our hearts, Lord. Uh, Today's scripture is pretty, it's a tough one. As as we deal with the cleansing of the temple, as we deal with the the fig tree that, that looked healthy but wasn't and wasn't bearing fruit. Uh, it requires a, 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 an examination of our own hearts as well. And so uh, I pray, Lord, for soft soil. We pray for, uh, for if there's anything that we do need to deal with, that we would uh, be able to l- deal with it today, deal with it with your word and apply it. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would just continue to bless the businesses within this church and um, as well as the, uh, the families and the marriages. And uh, we thank you so much for all that you're doing, uh, for all the hands and, and feet that helped set up this morning. We thank you for that. Uh, for all the servants, we thank you for them. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that we would just continue to, uh, to seek you. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. I forgot to tell you the last thing on here. I, I always jump through that. Uh, your, your love offering or tithe offering. The tithe box is over there. Um, you can do it through the, uh, the website at calvarydivine.org. We leave that between you and the Lord. We don't pass the plate or do any of that stuff. We believe that God will provide for the church the way that God needs to. And so uh, you can do it online or do it, do it over there on the Tide Box. And that's also for your prayer request. So if there's something that you need prayer for, that's what that box is for. Trust me, I got put in that box back in 2008 by my sister-in-law. And not just me, but my wife and my kids and all of us came to know Christ. So God, God hears those prayers, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, so as we jump into this, I need to cover verse 11 real quick. So again, we went over the triumphal entry a couple weeks ago when we had Easter, uh, right before Easter. And so if you need that teaching, you can... Again, we're verse by verse teaching, so that teaching is available online, um, and so you can definitely grab it. But verse 11 in Mark, Mark chapter 11 says, He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had already looked around at everything, it was already late, and he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus is looking at the temple, and he's looking at the leaders, the religious leaders that are actually gouging the worshipers. And not only that, he's watching people cut through the temple as a shortcut. The place that was supposed to be for prayer, he's watching all these people go in and out carrying stuff because it's a shortcut to get from one end of Jerusalem to the other. And so he's watching all that in verse 11. And and in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12, it says, At the time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who who are complacent, those who say no in in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will He do ill. And he's talking about the, the, those that are profiting off of the worshipers. Because they were selling them, saying, oh, you know, that, that lamb has blemishes. You can't use it. You need to buy one of the temple lambs. And they would upcharge it. Sounds familiar. That's what's happening to everybody today. Everybody's raising their prices right now. Right? You see that all, I mean, all over uh, San Antonio. And it's sad, but I know everything's going up, and so what do they do? They charge you. Um, but we also know that Jesus was, was weeping over the temple. And it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. So he wept over it. He, he's, they don't understand what's coming. The Romans are going to come and destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem. And, and he's seeing what's happening because he is the chief priest. And this is his house. And so when we get into our verses today, we pick it up from verse 12. So I entitled this simply, The Curse, the Cleanse, and the Withered Faith of a Nation. The Curse, the Cleanse, and the Withered Faith of a Nation. We'll look at it in three parts from verses 12 through 14, The Curse of the Fig Tree. Uh, and ver- verses 15 through 19, the cleanse of the temple. And then finally, the uh, verses 20 through 25. It's also, some of y'all may have verse 26, depending on the 
version of the Bible that you have. Some may have, uh, don't have 26 because it's all covered in 25 depending on the version that you have. And I'll, uh, but from 20 to 26, the cause for the decay, the decayed fig tree. So last week we left off with Bartimaeus. And, and remember, we, we're, and, and this is going to tie into what we learned this week as well. Uh, but I love the fact that uh, Bartimaeus, uh, with faith, was crying out to the Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus is, is set on Jerusalem. He's set on the cross at this point. This is the last week of his earthly ministry. So there's going to be a lot of things that are going to unfold over these next few chapters. And, and we know that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the bridge between man and God. It's Jesus. So as he, as he goes and, and looks at the cursing of the fig tree and the, the cleansing of the temple, it's come almost like a bookend. Because you're going to have the curse of the fig tree, the cleansing of the temple, and then the decay of the, the fig tree. And it's going to be very important as we look at this because what we, we notice nowadays what happens is we have this, this concept of image versus reality. Okay? And, and one of the things that's really problematic with this fig tree is that the image of it looked really good. Same way that your Instagram or your TikTok or your Facebook looks. You don't put the, the raw stuff on there, the reality stuff. When we think about the reality TV shows, they're scripted. Uh, it, you know, if you didn't know that, they, they were always scripted. It's like my dad told me, he worked in TV, he goes, they can't set those cameras up and mics up just randomly. So sometimes they have to have the fight come from different angles. It's all scripted. And even if they catch something that's reality, the editor or the director, they're, they're going to splice it up to the narrative that they want. And so when we look at our lives, we have to look at it as, as the reality is, is as we are in church, is the image consistent with the reality? And we'll get into that. Like I said, this is not going to be an easy teaching. So I apologize right off the bat. Trust me, it hit me hard this week myself. There are some things I was like, Lord, I got some stuff that needs to be cleansed out of my own temple. Okay? So I, as I'm learning this, I'm getting hit with this too. So I don't want you to think just because I'm a pastor, I'm like, oh, it don't, it's not for me. It's for me too. So we look at verse 12, the curse of the fig tree. So he's, he's, as he comes in the next morning, in verse 12 it says, On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. This is Jesus. So remember, Jesus, fully God, fully man, sinless. But he gets hungry, and we just read that he weeps. He wept over the, the, uh, the decay of the city of Jerusalem. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf and went to see if it could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So you can imagine the disciples are like, Man, did Jesus wake up on the wrong, wrong side of the... The bed, what's going on here, right? Why is he so upset? Is he that hungry? So Jesus curses the, uh, the, the fig tree. And, and there's, the thing is, is when the figs produce, they produce a smaller fruit and then they sp produce the bigger fruit at the end of the season. There should have been something on the tree. But the tree had leaves and the tree looked healthy. And the tree represents the religious leaders of the time. The scribes and the Pharisees. They also represent the nation of Israel. They, they had a temple. They had worship. They had Passover. But sadly, the nations weren't hearing about God. They had all these scribes and Pharisees that would, that would look perfect. Like they were doing everything according to the law. But they weren't. 
Everything looked good, the image, but the reality was they, they, they had a problem with the heart. And, and that's really what, what they get to. When we look at the scribes and the Pharisees, it says that uh, back in Matthew, when Jesus spoke to them in Matthew 23, verse 15, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Proselyte is simply a Gentile who's been converted into Judaism. And he says that you make him into a child of hell twice as much. Why? Because you're teaching them the wrong things. You're doing the things wrong and you're teaching them wrong. That's a wake-up call for us at our homes. We tell our kids one thing, but we're not living it. Your leaves look good at church, but when we peel back to look for fruit, it's not there. And your kids know it. They're the first ones to know it. You know who the second that knows it? Children's ministry. Your kids, man, they'll... T- Everything gets poured out. I had a, a pastor. I'm not saying here. I know all the kids are like, well, I'm going to put my kids in. But what it is, I remember one of our youth, our, our children's ministry pastors would say, he goes, we know everything that's going on in the church because the kids share and ask for prayer. And he goes, so we know how to pray for families. Right? And I guess the biggest question is, is if, if, if we look at Israel and the scribes and the Pharisees as being cursed right is is god done with israel i want to address that real quickly no okay and and paul the apostle paul deals with that in romans chapter 11 it says now if their trespasses mean riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the gentiles how much more will their full inclusion mean meaning that hey they rejected jesus but the gentiles us we got to receive christ it was available to us and eventually there will be a, a major group of, of Jews that will come to know faith. It will happen. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Their hearts had been hardened. Until the fullness of the Gentiles had come. And in, in the way all Israel will be saved as, as it was written, the liberal will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins as regards the gospel they are enemies for your sake but as regards election they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers for their gifts for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable meaning God's not done with Israel okay there'll be a great awakening But what will happen is they will still, it's not an elect type of awakening where you're Jew and you automatically go to heaven. You still have to repent and ask Christ into your heart. But there will be a a major turnaround for the the Jewish uh, nation, for Israel. But as we look at it, what we're looking at is is us. The religious, are are we being religious? Uh, Are we... Like the scribes and the Pharisees, are we, do we have no fruit? It's a Sunday. We can come in and we know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We know how to pre- behave. We know how to pray for people. We, know how to, we may even have a favorite scripture we like to quote. But there's no fruit. Do you know what the biggest problem is in the church today? A bunch of fig trees with no fruit. That is the biggest problem. That is why there's such a falling away. The church has to revive. Meaning the church has to actually start living out their faith. I'm going to be hard on the church. Because at the end of the day, what it is, is we have an image that we're portraying, but the reality, they're, they're seeing it. They're going... That guy says he's a Christian, but he's at the bar every night. He's hooked on meth. He goes to church, raises his hands during worship, hallelujah, and then he's drunk three hours later on Sunday. 
cursing out the kids. You look healthy, but there's no fruit. It hurts the witness of God. Remember in Mark, it says in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy, you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart, and, and that's what God searches is the heart. So is there evidence in your walk that you're bearing fruit? Do you understand that as a Christian, you're supposed to bear fruit? There should be evidence. People should know, hey, that person's a Christian. Man, there's something different about him or her. They should know that. See, what happens is we have this, this image again. An image of a fairy tale faith. And we start peeling back the leaves and, and we start seeing that there's no evidence of, of Christ changing anything in their lives. Or either there's just some things they just haven't let go of yet and that, I, I'm gonna, there's not going to be any fruit on this branch. Because I, like, I love being angry. And I need to be allowed to be angry. So God's not, God, I'm not putting any fruit over here. That's not how it works. God said He wanted all of you, not some of you. Let me tell you something. There's evidence. Let me explain what evidence looks like. Evidence is very simply this. When Matthew was six or seven years old, he would make uh, Nesquik. And there was evidence that he had made it. Meaning chocolate milk. Meaning there was powder all over the counter. There was milk, a dirty spoon, and a ring from his little cup. There was evidence that Matt had been there. And for us, there should be evidence in our walks as well. We have to ask ourselves, are, are we willing to die to self daily? Or are we taking those opportunities to learn through obedience? I'm, I'm not talking about a life of perfection. It's not a life of perfection. It's a life of, per, of pursuing holiness, pursuing righteousness. And let me tell you something, you are going to fall flat on your face at some point. But that's why you have Christ. And, and the biggest thing that your kids need to see or your, your, your spouse needs to see or, or, or your family needs to see, your extended friends, hey man, I messed up. I, I, I bit the dust. Jesus had to help me back up. I was wrong. You'd be honest with them. But if we were looking for a, a life of obedience to His Word and living out our faith, it... it it's sad because what we have is a lot of Christians that just have this fairy tale faith, an image that they have that's online. They have an image that they look godly. Look, I can take a picture all day long from, with me behind a pulpit. I did that at Mission Divine. But if my life doesn't represent that at home, shame on me. I shouldn't be doing this. And, and whether I was doing this or I was, I used to be the sound guy. Whether I was being sound guy or I was being, being a teacher of the Word, either way, God still held me accountable. And guess what? Before I was a sound guy, I was the husband. And I'm still the husband. And God still holds me accountable as a believer. But see, I can't have a fairy tale faith. I, I, I want to see, you know, the, the work of God being done and, and not just in my life, but in the life of my kids. And I want, to, I want to know that there's proof, there's evidence that, hey, Mike's a believer. And I, I forget what pastor it was, but I can't remember if C.S. Lewis or somebody that said, if we were to put your faith on trial, would you be found guilty or not guilty of being a Christian? Guilty of being a Christian or not guilty? There's no evidence. 
In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Let me read that again to you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We are to abide in who? Christ. We are to walk the same way as who? Christ. We walk the same as Christ. We, we, Christ knew the Word of God. Even in these Scriptures that we're going to go over today, Christ quotes Scripture. He knew God's Word. Christ was obedient to the Father all the way to the, to the point of death, even death on the cross. He walked in obedience to the Word in His life. He, he prayed daily. He had fellowship with the disciples. But see, what happens is so many of us in our fairy tale faith, we're practicing the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. It's all about me. When you give your heart to Christ, it's not about you anymore. The biggest problem is not your spouse. The biggest problem is not your mom or your dad. It's the person staring at you in the mirror. That's the problem. Because that's who God holds accountable. You. So when you give your heart to Christ, there should be fruit. It, it comes from having a Christ-centered life. It, it means that, look, even when you're going through whatever, whatever trial, whatever suffering, whatever, whatever thing that you fell into, that you can cling to Christ and know that He's there. And that He's going to pull you out of it. All you have to do is repent. Remember what Bartimaeus said? Have mercy on me. Just cry out, have mercy on me, Lord. You know me. And you go, man, I, I just got done doing this a week ago. Have mercy on me. I'm going to get this. But I need your help. And we go from the curse of the fig tree now to the cleanse of the temple. It gets a little tougher now. Y'all probably are like, let's stop here. Let's go ahead and call it a day, right? Verse 15 we see, and it says, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So remember in verse 11, that's why it was so important. Jesus did what? He looked at the temple. And He saw them. They had turned the temple into a swap meet. And that's what it had become. A bazaar. A place of commerce. There was bribery and extortion that was happening in the temple. It's a good reminder that the church needs to be careful of the same thing. We've actually had pastors that sell their books in stores and they have bookstores and they, they boost their book sales so they can hit the New York Times bestseller list and they got caught doing it. Same thing. Don't need to be doing that. But we know that Jesus had righteous rage and He cleansed His house because He's the chief priest. He's, the, he's turning tables over. And, and I can tell you, I, you may start off with righteous rage, but at some point, it's going to turn to wrath. To me, this is something only Jesus can do. And I'll, I'll explain why. We had to escort somebody out of the church, our other church that we came from. We had been there many years, and then we were sent out here to plant the church. And we had somebody that was creating division within the church, was saying stuff about our senior pastor that was wrong. Um, and, and when I confronted him about it, because he came to the wrong person, he had went into the men's group and started doing it through the men's group to different people to try to see if he could get other people to agree with him. And then when I asked him, he told me, well, he taught something that was unbiblical. I said, well, can you tell me what verse it was and what teaching it was so I can listen to it? Well, I don't know what it was. It was just unbiblical. I said, I've been here since 2009. 
I've never heard that man teach anything on biblical. He teaches verse by verse, chapter by chapter. He doesn't do that. Let's go talk to the senior pastor so we can find out what it is that you're having a problem with. So we did. We went and talked to Joe, and in the conversation, he forgets during this time in the men's thing, he's done told us about all the sin that he's doing. Going to Thailand and meeting with some girl, and I mean, just a mess. A mess. Nothing that a Christian should do. But yet, he's making it seem like the leaves are good. But there's no fruit. So he gets upset with Joe. Now we have kids right outside Joe's door. It's Wednesday night. Everybody's getting ready to go home. Service is over. And he decides to get mouthy with Joe. And threatens him. And I said, okay man, it's time. You got to go. And about that time, he was ready to throw down with our senior pastor. So at that time, I'm prior military. I grab, I lift, we're moving out the door. Now, at that point, I'm sure that was righteous anger in a moment because I'm thinking, I got to protect these kids because we have kids in the hallway. And we're trying to get him out of here because he's getting loud and cursing loud and threatening. Move him out the door. My son immediately, Matt, comes behind me and helps out. So we're moving him out the door. Now at that point, if I would have walked away, maybe, but that wasn't it. He kept mouthing off at me. And at that point, whatever righteous thing I thought I was doing turned to anger and almost became wrath. And somebody grabbed me. Thank God they did because I was already looking at, I'm prior military. I'm looking at, I mean, court will tell you this. Any of the guys that have been in the military, um, David as well. You know, when we start sizing people up, if we got to assess something, we're going for kneecaps and we're, we're taking you out. And that's what I was doing. So at that point, it went from what I thought maybe was righteous to anger to wrath really quickly. And thank God one of the other pastors came in and said, hey, Mike, I got him. You go ahead and go on inside. See, we have to understand that Jesus can have righteous anger. Jesus can overturn things. And Jesus can do the work that needs to be done in the temple because He is the high priest. So how's your temple? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, do you, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you are bought with the price, so glorify God in your body. Is there something in your temple that needs to be overturned? That Jesus needs to cleanse? What needs to be driven out of your heart today? I'm trying not to make eye contact. I'm trying to look as far out as I can not make eye contact with people. It's a tough scripture. But we have to ask ourselves, is there something in our hearts that needs to be dealt with? We do. Trust me, I, I sat there with the scripture this week and had to go, man, I got some stuff that needs to be... God, you need to overturn that. It needs to go. I don't know how I got residence there, but it needs to go. Help me. Lord, have mercy on me. You know, it's, it's important for us to remember that. So, it says in verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So again, they were using the temple as a shortcut. They had no intention of worshiping God at all. It was just a shortcut. We had that happen Wednesday night. We had somebody come in. They had to get something out the back. They had no intention on being here for the Lord. They used it as a shortcut to get what they had to get. It happens. In verse 17, it says, And He was teaching them. So this is where we go from righteous anger to what does Jesus start doing? He starts teaching them. And saying to them, It is not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus begins to teach them. And he quotes Scripture. He quotes Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, it says, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in His steps. So you are to walk 
the way that Christ did and abide how Christ did because you have been called to follow in His steps. How's that going? See, we have to be careful as, as a, a church. The church is, is to be a house of prayer, a place of worship. It's not a place of business, of commerce. Like if I have shirts and mugs and stuff, hey, buy all this stuff, that would be wrong. But see, we've done that with our churches today. We've, we've treated our churches like nightclubs. See, y'all don't have, know how blessed you are to have acoustic worship. When you come from a church that is a full-blown 15 people on stage, earth, wind, and fire event, it's so nice to just be able to just come and worship. Because you know what you're here to do? You're here to worship God. Same with me. You're not here for me. You're here to hear the Word of God. So when you come to, to hear a pastor, well, you know what will happen is people will... I've had this happen. I've had... Uh, right before I was going to teach, I was putting the mic on, and he goes, are you teaching today? I said, yes, sir. And he goes, Ugh. and he walked out. He wanted to hear Joe. He was only there for Joe. He didn't understand that he was still hearing from God's Word. You're here to worship God. You're here to hear from God, to hear His Word. But see, what happens is we treat the churches like nightclubs now. We have to have all the lights and all the stuff. We have pastors who spend time on self-help sermons instead of teaching the Word of God. And unfortunately, we have a lot of worship leaders that think they're auditioning for American Idol. Or The Voice. And we've forgotten what worship is supposed to be about. So we're not supposed to just pass casually through here. You come here to be in God's Word. You come here to worship God. What worship does is usher you into the Word of God. It's to be a house of prayer. And it's, it's not an exclusive club. What happened is the nation of Israel had, had focused so much on, on, on themselves that they had forgot that it was, it was for all nations. And that's the thing with Christianity. It's not an exclusive club. It's for everybody. It's for all. That means if somebody walks in here who's transgender or walks in here as the LGBT community or walks in here with a, with a social, let's, let's stand up and let's go against everybody, they're welcomed here. Because they're here for the Word of God. How else do you think a heart is supposed to change? But yet what happens is we treat our churches like they're exclusive clubs. Oh, no, 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 you, no, no, you can't be here. That goes against everything that, that Jesus taught. Because Jesus dined with the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the sinners. Because how else is He going to convert them into following Him? You have to talk to them. How else? Do you think somebody who walks in here that is struggling with that lifestyle, that they're just going to, I gave my life to the Lord and it's all going to get fixed the next day? No. It's not. It's going to take time for God's Word to wash over them. It's going to take time for God to start producing fruit. We know that fruit is not produced overnight. But the church expects that to happen that way. There's a great teaching uh, on Calvary Chapel, Albuquerque on their summer series on homosexuality. You should listen to it. I'll post it up on the thing today. Because it talks about welcoming everyone into the church everyone meaning we're not going to shy away from teaching god's word but i don't know how we expect them ever to get god's word if we don't invite them into the church
We have to share our faith. This is not an exclusive club. This is a house of prayer. Acts 13, 47 says, For so the Lord had commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It's for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. But he says, But you have made my den a den of robbers. And so it's supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. Verse 18 says, And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him, to kill him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So, you have the religious leaders hearing Jesus teach, and they still have a hard heart and walk away from it. And want to do what? Let's kill him. So that tells you there's going to be times when, when you're going to teach or you're going to share something and they're not going to receive it. It's just, it is what it is. That means even with you as you share the gospel with somebody, there's going to be times when people just don't receive it. And they may want to kill you. Because you're telling them something that's like, it's hitting them in the heart, man. Because I've had it done to me before where I, I don't want to hear it, bro. I just want to kill you. You need to get out of here. I've done that before. And, 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 but I can remember that pounding in the heart of knowing, hey, I need this. But I was so prideful, I didn't want it. I was so prideful, I didn't want it. I even think back to my time in the Army. They, out of all the things, what, did I, what was my job supposed to be? Chaplain's assistant. I was like, I'm not working on Sunday. Wouldn't take it. God tried to get a hold of me back when I was 17. Hard heart, prideful. People try to share the gospel with me, but hard heart. Just know that as you share the gospel, as you share the word, that it's going to be times when there are going to be people that come against you. The last little part here in verses 20-26 through 26, or 20 through 25, depending on what uh, version of the Bible you have, which translation. Uh, it says the, the cause for the decayed fig tree. So as they passed it by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered, which means decayed, it went away to its roots. And, and Peter remembered and said to Rabbi, look, so he was astonished, right? And the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Right off the bat, Jesus tells them to have faith in God. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things to hope for, the conviction of things not seen. And when I thought about that verse, the thing I thought about was Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had faith. He had heard about Jesus. He had heard that Jesus had healed, that Jesus had cast out demons. And he hears that Jesus is coming, and he starts crying out to Jesus, Lord, Son of David, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of David, have mercy on me. Right? He starts crying out. And then what happens? The crowd rebukes him. And he still has faith because he knows the only person that can heal him is who? Jesus. And he starts crying out even louder. That's faith. Who do you trust in when you cry out? It's, it's trusting in, in Christ, knowing that, that God's hearing us. It's, it's that trustworthiness that we have in, in our object of faith, which is in God. In verse 23, it says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, does not uh, doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass and it will, will be done for him. Now, Prior, prior to, I can remember reading this verse and when I read that now and we look at what happened with Bartimaeus, doesn't that make sense now? Bartimaeus is like, hey, take that mountain, throw it into the sea. Jesus is coming. He's going to heal me. That's faith. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the faith of knowing that there's no doubt in your heart 
when you ask. In James chapter five verses, uh, James chapter one verses five through eight, it says, "If anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded uh, man, unstable in all his ways." It's by faith we ask. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, it says, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as, the, as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do so, they the, do the same, they were drowned. It's by faith the walls of Jericho uh, fell down after they had in, encircled for seven days. It's by faith. You can read all of Hebrews 11. It's nothing but faith after faith after faith after faith. It's to try to help you in your faith to know who the confidence who you're asking. You're asking God, the creator of everything. It says in verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now this doesn't mean that you go, I need a new house. I need a new Lexus. Because that's where the prosperity movement comes from. That's not it. Psalm 37 verse 4 is, explains it extremely well. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Meaning that the things that you want and the things that God want line up. And I, I can tell you early on, in 2009 when I gave my life to the Lord, early on by faith, the one thing I asked for, Lord save my marriage. The thing that I wanted in my heart was the same thing that God wanted because God wants it's a covenant with Him. He wants to keep that marriage together. And God answered that prayer. And, and so we, 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 we have to come, to come to Him by faith and we need to be asking Him prayer. Problem is, is we don't ask. We're not specific in our prayers. What do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? Recover my sight. He was very specific in what his need was. And John 14, 13 and 14 says, uh, or John 14, verses 13 and 14 says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. It's understanding that we're asking according to His will and according to His character and purpose. So one of the things I know is as, as believers, we're, we, we lack this in our lives. This is a part of our faith that we lack, that we struggle with. You don't believe that mountain can be tossed into the sea. You don't believe when you're praying for, and I, I'll, I, I'll share this with you. I remember praying for my brother when he had cancer. And I, all I kept having in my heart was this, that, that verse in Mark, Lord, help my unbelief. And I struggled with that. I was like, why am I struggling with that? Because my faith, because there was pancreatitis. Oh, it can never be healed. You don't think God can heal that? I was young in my faith. And God had to show me. Your faith. You need, to, you need to trust in me. I believe that that same question that Jesus asked us last week, what do you want, want me to do for you? You can't answer today. You can answer it, but are you, are you trusting in faith that it's going to be answered? What do you want me to do for you? In Mark chapter 10, verse 51, when Jesus asked that question, what do you want me to do for you? In faith. Is there somebody that you go, I, I need them to come and know Jesus Christ. And you go, it'll never happen. Well, no, it's not going to because your, your faith is not there. Where, what's going on? Be specific. 
And finally, in verse 25, it says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, also who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. This is a wake-up call. I told you this was not going to be an easy one. One of the hardest things to do is to forgive somebody. People will hang on to unforgiveness. And and trust me, nobody's saying you have to go... I forget how C.S. Lewis used to say it. What you're doing is... and I'll, I'll, I'll share as much of this as I can without trying to give up too much. Um, just because it's personal. Um, one of the things I know early on in faith, we, we, um, we, we had somebody that came back into our life that should never have been there in the first place. And honestly, I wanted to kill the man. And I remember going and talking to my pastor. And he reminded me, he was like, Mike, you reap what you sow. Which I was like, come on, Joe, you got to give me something better than that. But honestly, since 17, since age 17, I had reaped into being, uh, committing adultery. From 17 years old, I got married at 17. So from 17 years old, committing adultery and creating problems within my marriage that creates a divide for 22 years. My wife had had enough and, had, and she had found somebody that she was talking to. That person decides to come back a year later into our lives. Tries to get a hold of her. And my wife was graciously and said, hey, this person's trying to get in contact with me. And I, I told Joe because I came into the church and Joe goes, are you all right? And I said, I could pick the church up and throw it across the street. That's how upset I was. And I told him what happened. And he looked at me and he goes, you reap what you sow. You've sown into this, Mike. And I was like, man. And I had so much unforgiveness and hate towards this person. I didn't even know him. Personally. And, and what God did is, as I'm driving home and I'm, that thing is rattling around in my head, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow, it hit me. Yeah, you're the one who created the division in the marriage. It was you. You sown into it. Now you're reaping the benefits of it. This is the problem. And so I had to ask, you know, as, as I pray that for anyone that, that I, if you have any, anything against anyone, so that your Father also in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Right? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So I had to pray that day, and I asked, Lord, forgive me for having hate against this brother that I don't know. And forgive this sin that I've allowed, this, this hardness in my heart that I've allowed in my heart. Because God revealed it. He's showing me in the temple. You know what happened? I, I was like, Lord... And I knew I was never going to see this person unless they gave their life to the Lord and we'll see each other in heaven, which is awesome. But I was like, you know what this man needs? The same thing I needed, Jesus. Lord, he's your child. He was created in your image. Save him, save his marriage, save his family. Let them all come to faith. And there was, I'm telling you, it was like a a weight had been lifted off me. Now, I don't know whatever happened to that person. I have no clue. Nobody's telling you you got to get on the phone and say, I forgive you. What you're doing is you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to allow this to have resonance in my heart anymore. If God is exposing it to you or showing you that, hey, this person hurt me when I was a child. 
physically, abusively, whatever. Like you're not, nobody's telling you to get on the phone and call the person, but you just, man, Lord, for, I just need to forgive whatever's going on in my heart, this thing that's been here for years. I need you to help me with it. Because it's hindering me from having my walk with you. And it's affecting all these other relationships. Forgive me. And, and if you say that you can't forgive somebody, you need to go read the, um, what is it, the Corey Tim Boom movie? You need to watch that. Because the person who actually persecuted her in, in the German prison actually came and asked for forgiveness. And she talks about that. She was a Holocaust survivor. And this person was physically and verbally abusive. And she said when that guy showed up at one of her talkings, she just froze because all that fear, all that stuff, all of it was just right there. And this big old man asked for, asked for forgiveness. So when we read that verse, and, and, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. My wife had to forgive me. She had to actually just say, Lord, he's yours. It, it is, it, it's, it's not an easy thing. So I don't want you to think I can just read this off and go, oh, you just got to do it. It's, it's something that God needs to do in your heart. But it, it's a reminder to us whenever we stand praying, forgive. If, you, if, anyone, if anything, if you have anything against anyone, so the Father also in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. It's, it's not an easy one. And I don't have time to read it, but you need to read it. Read Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. Okay? Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. It talks about the, the man who owed all this money and he was forgiven. And then, and then somebody owed him just a, a hundred denaria and he, he wouldn't forgive him. And then eventually put the person in jail. And when the person found out that he had done that, he's like, why did, you, why did I forgive you of your debt if you were just going to hold it against this other person? It's a great, great parable that Jesus gives, and I, I would strongly suggest you read it. So we see the, the, the curse of the fig tree, or their fruit, right? So what is the image, what is the reality? Are you a healthy tree that looks healthy, but when we start inspecting, there's no fruit? You haven't produced fruit in years. You go, but I've been walking with Christ for 10, 15, 20, 13 years. You can stop producing fruit. You can start going back to your old ways. It happens. What is the reality? Is there fruit? Do you have a fairy tale faith? Is it all image? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The other piece of application, is there something in your heart that needs to be cleansed? Is there something that has to be cleansed out of your temple today? Because your body is the Holy Spirit. And the temple of the Holy Spirit, is it resides, the Holy Spirit resides in our hearts. When we give our hearts to Christ, we belong to Him. And finally, this is a house of prayer. If we have something that we're holding against a brother or a sister, if, uh, if, you, if you have something that you're holding against a family member, or a worker, that you can't stand, You need to deal with that stuff. We need to ask for forgiveness. 
Because we all have things that are going on in our hearts. Trust me, I, I can guarantee you if, if there's something that God is trying to show you right now. Because I know for me, as I was reading this this week, I was like, man, I got some work to do. And it's okay because I'm His. I don't want to be fake. I'm the same person here at my house. I'm just as goofy at the house as I am here. We have to be the same. We can't, we can't try to be something that we're not. But I can tell you this. If you've given your heart to Christ, repentance should bear fruit. That, that's in Scripture. If you're not producing fruit, you need to ask the Lord to check your temple. And, and, and check to see if there's something in there that needs to be cleansed out. Okay? Let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for today. We do pray as we dive into this uh, scripture. There's a lot here. And I pray. I know it's hard at, at the end of the day as we, as we look at different things that are different aspects of the, the scripture that we need to deal with, whether it's uh, whether the image is... We, we have a certain image that we portray, but it's not the reality of our faith. I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us with that. If we're struggling, maybe, we, maybe we've gotten away from doing the things we used to do, like being in the Word of God and, and, and spending time in prayer and spending time in fellowship. Help us get back to that. Um, if, if, we're, if there's something that we've allowed into the temple that needs to go, let us deal with that. I love Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus cried out, cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. Sometimes that's what we have to do. Lord, have mercy on me. Remember what Paul said, the things, the things I, 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 I want to do are the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I, I don't want to do, I do. And, and at the end of the day, he's like, at, I, what a man I am that uh, just struggle. We struggle. And, and, and Lord, allow us to, to remember that our faith is in You. Let us believe that if You say, hey, move this mountain into the sea, it'll happen. If we're struggling with that verse, let's go back and read about Bartimaeus because we see a man that had such faith, a man who believed that he was going to be healed by Jesus, even after the rebukes. And even when he was confronted by Jesus, he was, he was very specific in his prayer. And I pray that we would, do, we would be the same way. I thank you so much for everyone that's here, Lord. I pray that, uh, uh, that you would continue to be with us, uh, continue to speak to our hearts throughout this week. Allow us to have conversations on the way home, uh, realistically about what it is that maybe there are things that we need to work on. Maybe we need to ask Lord, you know, forgive me for, for acting this way. You know, maybe there was something I did earlier this week where I'd irritated you, and, and just forgive me, Lord. You know, work in our hearts, Lord. That's what we pray for. Let us bear fruit. And, and let us be a, uh, just a walking, talking billboard for you, Lord. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So Wednesday night, 6.30, uh, make sure you read the introduction to uh, the book. Um, remember, if you want to grab the homework, you can grab it. And uh, we hope to see you at 6.30 here, calvarydivine.org, if you need to get a hold of anything. God bless.